anyone who would like to attend the Seder meal, I believe it is the 14th, it's Monday Thursday, it's Monday Thursday of Holy Week, it is $10 a person, it'll begin at 6 o'clock, and then after that we're going to move into the sanctuary to have communion. So uh, we'd like to have your reservation in by the 3rd, next Sunday, correct? All right, next Sunday. A couple other things. After meeting with worship and music a couple weeks ago in a session last week, we decided that starting next week with communion, we will be going back to intention. We are still going to provide the individual cups for those who are uncomfortable with coming forward, but we're going to return to doing that. Um, the passing of the peace as well, whatever you're comfortable with. If you want to shake hands, go for it. If you want to wave, go for it. If you want to bump elbows, I always get an elbow bump for Katie each week. Feel free to do that, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, as far as the offering, we are going to return to passing the offering once we have a schedule made up for it. Uh, so it may be next week, it may not be, uh, but Pat will be working on that uh, in the coming days and so. So we will return to that when we have a schedule. Um, is there any other announcements that we had? We can think of? Not for much. Any other announcements for today?
Merciful God, we confess that we have strayed from your ways. Like the prodigal son, we have wasted our inheritance. You gave us the earth for our own, but we squander earth's resources and hoard its bounty. You gave us neighbors to love, but we pursue selfish ambitions. You gave us commandments that lead to human flourishing, but we break your law and forsake your love. Forgive us our sin and bring us to repentance. Draw our wandering hearts back to you, that we may find freedom and obedience to your love. Merciful God, hear now our own personal confessions that we lift up to you in silence. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As a parent welcomes home a wayward child, so God embraces all who return in true repentance. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. imagine the excitement they must feel every time the phone rings. Maybe an excitement mixed with some nerves and anxiety that we don't know. Maybe this is the call. We think of how they must worry and hope that their little dog is safe. Have you ever lost something precious to you? You're in the hot seat now. Have you ever lost anything that meant something to you? The dog ran away. Sure, the dog. Anyone else? Anyone lose anything that we, yeah? Our turtle ran away, but we got it back. Good. You were, able to, you were able to catch up to the turtle, that's good. What else? Yeah. Your cat. Anything else? We've all seen to have that feeling. The lost pet is always a common thing. We see them a lot on July 4th, right? People still take their dogs out when the fireworks happen, and then all of a sudden dogs scurry all over, and it is a frantic night. Have you ever found something that you lost? What was it like when you found that pet? Dog, cat, or turtle. So we were we were like amazed. Amazed. Five months she was in the wilderness. Five, five months. months. Five weeks. No, five five weeks. weeks. That's so long. And that was long. I mean, yeah. the turtle was small. What are the chances? And someone brought her to our door who saw one of the signs. That's it. That's amazing. You that amazing relief and joy. Yeah. Out. We were, we were I just wanted to say something about dogs. I noticed with the pandemic. I never knew so many people had dogs, and they're always walking them. There are dogs all over the place. It's amazing. Have you, have any of you noticed more people walking with dogs? I live near a park, and so um, I don't know whether that's the reason, but people always walking their dogs, not cats, just dogs. I've seen a few people walking cats. That's 
though it's surprised. I have seen it, though. Well, in our Bible lesson today in Luke, we are going to hear a story about a man who lost something very precious to him. The story also tells us the man's joy when that which he lost was found. The story Jesus told, the prodigal son. A man had two sons, the younger one goes away, finally he comes home and there is joyous celebration for all but the older son that we're going to hear. So the boy looked around one day and saw, I gotta go home. I miss my family. Lord, we thank you for your record here for your unfailing love. We are thankful that even when we stray, you welcome us home with open arms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God's people say amen to that. Amen. This morning in our gospel reading, we are turning to the beloved parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 1 through 3, and 11 through 32. Together, let's listen to the word of the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took, took the place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran out and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves over and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fat calf. Because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began, You've given me a young calf, a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours came back, he has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Praise God. God. Grace is true. Right, what is it? You need to find grace. Sure, we know we are saved by grace through faith. That line was pounded into my head as a kid. Did I understand it? Do you? Grace is one of those fundamental words of our faith. It is fundamental and it's foundational. But it's not exactly clear. The best explanation I have come across from the Presbyterian minister and author Frederick Beekner. Now, some of you may have heard me say this before, but he was a one, he had a wonderful ability to make sense of very difficult theological ideas. And this is what he had to say about grace. Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It is for you 
I created the universe. I love you. Now he also adds an important note. Like any gift you receive, it can only be yours if you reach out and take it. And as we hear today, the grace of God is a gift, an amazing, extraordinary, scandalous gift. Now, last week, remember, we heard a challenging word about a fig tree. We're blessed because Christ is hard at work tilling and watering us until we produce good fruit. And this blessing calls for a response. We must repent. But of what? What are some of our shortfalls? We all have sins in our personal lives and we must repent of them. But what about us church members? If we're honest, we know the church folk also have some church-centered sins of which we must repent. For instance, pride, anger, jealousy, self-righteousness. Our egos are full of pride. After all, we have found Christ. We are in church each week, more or less. We proudly declare faith in our Lord and Savior. We can look at others who live a life without faith, without the church. But we can say to ourselves, Lord, thank you that I am not like these sinners. We're better than them. Certainly we get angry. Why is it so hard for people to find the light of Christ in their lives? We experience jealousy, especially if we really think about grace. Many of us have been in church as long as we can remember. We rarely, if ever, miss a Sunday. But what about the person who finds God near the end of their life? Is that person rewarded in the exact same way we are? Are we really okay with that idea? That feeling of jealousy ties right in with an air of self-righteousness. Others look at the church and the people in it as viewing ourselves like we're better than others. We are self-righteous. We know the gospel message. We know the real, ultimate truth. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we know each one of those sinful feelings. So yes, as we heard last week, we must repent. You know, we come by those feelings honestly. As we think about the parable of the prodigal son, don't we relate so closely to that older son? So often we romanticize this familiar story. A young person goes out into the world and gets lost, but deep down, deep down he has a heart of gold and finally comes back to be forgiven. It's a great story, a classic redemption story. But we are a long time removed from the people hearing Jesus teach this lesson. Culturally, socially, religiously, geographically. So it's hard to understand the depth this is. The young son is acting like his father is already dead. He severs any relationship with his brother. Now, this is a society that completely centers around family. Family is everything. Love, security, food, shelter, everything. This young son throws that all away to live a life of pure excess. And in doing all of this, he exposes his family to the criticism from the entire community. He makes his own family outcasts in that area. The young son is a despicable person. What about the older son? How does he react? He's prideful because he remains and never asks for anything. He's angry that his younger brother left the way he did, and even angrier at how he is treated when he returns. He's jealous that you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. We know this person, the older brother. We are this person. 
like the older son, these feelings frequently cause us to assume the worst in others. Just think of this story. Anyone think the younger son was rehearsing his apology to make it as believable as possible? Trying to get those tears to respond at the perfect moment. Seems like the younger son hopes throwing himself at his father's feet may at least get him something. And he basically admits it himself. How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. Now the whole story with this younger child seems suspicious at best and deceitful at worst. We know he's just going to run away again once he gets more money. Yeah, we do come by these feelings honestly. Because we know the older brother. We are the older brother. And yet trying to identify ourselves with either brother causes us to miss the central point of this story. It's not about the younger brother the prodigal. And neither is it about the older brother. The parable of the prodigal son is all about the father, and specifically his response. You see, the original audience would not have been surprised that the younger son returns. That was common, a common theme in Jewish stories. Think of Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, the lost or wayward child always was redeemed, always returns home. The real shock of the story is the amazing, extraordinary, scandalous reaction of the father. See, as we read the story, we can get a sense that the father was keeping vigil outside the family house, hoping his younger son would one day return. The light was always on, flickering in the darkness, calling his son home. And he punished. The surprise then is the outpouring of love and mercy. We can picture this father. Every time he hears a noise, he looks up to the horizon, hoping against hope his child will come walking down that path. And though each time the son is not there, the father keeps looking with the same eager anticipation time after time after time. And so finally, there he is. Now I think after all this time, the father must have done a double take, right? He looks up, hoping he will see his son, but out of habit, looks back down in disappointment. It takes a minute for his brain to catch up with his eyes. And suddenly, it clicks. There he is. There's my son. Without another thought, the father is running, running to his little boy. The dad throws his arms around his son and kisses him. You can feel that emotion, and that apology for the younger son rehearsed or not barely gets said, because there isn't enough time. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But we don't hear what the father says there, but we can imagine something like, stop, stop. You're home now. Now you're home. I've missed you so much. I love you, and you are home, and that is all that matters. And he throws a party for his son. A party of unbelievable abundance. For God, celebrating the return of a lost child is not enough. The joy of God's welcome is always joined by God's gracious abundance. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like grace. Amazing, extraordinary, scandalous grace. Friends, the story of the prodigal son is all about that grace. The kind of amazing grace that 
God offers creation. God waits for us. God keeps a vigil for us, constantly looking to the horizon to see if we are walking home. And when we do, it is a heavenly celebration. The grace of God is extraordinary. We could be punished. We could, we should be punished. But instead, God wraps loving arms around us and welcomes us home. That's why God's grace is scandalous if we keep thinking of grace as the older son does. If we think of it in terms of our worldly lives, this kind of scandalous grace and mercy should not exist. People should face consequences for their actions. And yet, in the kingdom of heaven, God proclaims that grace is above all else. Abundance trumps anger. Mercy outweighs punishment. Wayward children are welcomed home by the loving parents. And what wonderful news that is for us today. Last week, we heard we must repent. And we know, we know, if we look into our own hearts, we have much for which we need to repent. But today, that message continues. Today, we hear how God responds to our repentance with amazing, extraordinary, scandalous grace. Today, God says to each of us, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. God created each of us. God loves each of us. God loves each of you. God created everything for us. Though we walk away from God, God never forgets us. God wakes up at night, shining a light in all directions, hoping we come home. God spends each day looking in the distance, refusing to miss a single lost child. And when one returns, God's response is unbridled joy and celebration. So do not fear repentance. Yes, we will be judged and should be judged, but our judge is one of mercy. Our judge is one of love. The Lenten season that we are in is a reminder that God gave everything for us. Christ died on the cross, defeating sin and overcoming death. So when you repent, God's loving arms are always open waiting to wrap around you. You just need to reach out and accept that grace of God. If you do, and when you do, you will experience the amazing, extraordinary, scandalous grace of God. And there is nothing better in this world or in the heavenly kingdom. So friends, repent. Because God is waiting with love, mercy, and grace. Extraordinary, amazing, scandalous grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you are a God of grace and mercy. You welcome us home as a parent, eagerly awaiting the return of a wayward child. Today, open our hearts to your love light in the world, keeping vigil for all your lost children. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, please rise if you're able. Sure, we're going to change to Amazing Grace. Do you remember? 649, Amazing Grace.
confirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We do have a couple of prayer requests already. As you have we've seen the bulletin, Margarita had to fly out to Texas, uh, fly out today. Uh, her friend, uh, Manuel, passed away this week. So uh, we pray for her for safe travels and for uh, Manuel's family. Also got a call from Sue this morning. Her mom was taken to the hospital, which is why she's not with us this morning. So we pray for Sue and her mom and her family. Are there any other prayers, joys, or concerns you wish to share today? Nancy. Just safe travels for Andy and Kelly um, at the end of the week. prayers of the people. Each petition will end by saying, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world, that all Christians may embody the reconciling love of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. the nations of the world and their leaders, that all may dwell in peace and that justice may be tempered by mercy. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the planet Earth, God's gift to humankind, that all may share wisely his resources and conserve his riches for our, for our children's children. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. For our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who are sick or in trouble, for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may be restored to fullness of life and livelihood. Today especially we pray for Manuel and his family. For God and for Andy and Kelly, for the family of John. We celebrate is his dad turning 60. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the lost, for those who have abandoned God, friends, or family, and for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world 
in our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, with grateful hearts, let us bring our tithes and our offerings to the God from whom they came. Thanks be to God. 